after conceiving and bearing first Reuben, Reuben and then Shimon, and then Levi, when she conceives and bears Yehuda, she, she declares this time, Leah, I will praise. Literally, this time I am thankful. Now it's a little hard to digest the notion that it's not until her fourth child does the great matriarch, Leah, finally develop a spirit of thankfulness to Hashem for what he has blessed her so abundantly with, especially in a culture where the, morta the, the mortality rate for infants was 50%. With it, whatever took place in her heart, it created a cosmic shift in her attitude. And from this moment on, she adapted a posture of continuous, nonstop, ever-increasing gratitude. Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the congregation in Philippi, expresses his own spirit of modeani, of thankfulness and appreciation for that which I believe we often overlook and frequently take for granted. And that is an appreciation and a thankfulness for each other. Philippi was a very special congregation. There were really no major problems amongst the Philippians. He, Rabbi Shul says in verse 3, I thank my God every time I think of you. Now let me get this straight. That's a, a rabbi or pastor saying that. I don't have any memories of you, Shul is saying, that are negative. Whenever I pray for all of you, I always pray with joy. Everything about the Philippians gave the Apostle Paul joy. It doesn't mean that they didn't have any needs. Oh, Lord, they had needs. In fact, in chapter 4 in the same book of Philippians, he talks about a couple of women who had needs. I beg of Odaya and I beg Sintich to agree with each other in union with the Lord. What he's saying with great people skills and diplomacy here, is he's saying, is for somebody to help these ladies stop bickering and get their act together. <laughs> Rabbi Shavuot wasn't oblivious to the few issues that existed in Philippi, but he rejoiced nonetheless in their level of spiritual commitment. They loved Hashem. They loved Torah. They loved Yeshua. They loved their Rabbi Shaul. And more than any of the other congregations, they cared for Rabbi Shaul with an unusual zeal. They continually blessed him with gifts of money to meet his needs, to, to support him. Mind you, they weren't particularly wealthy, but they were generous in their giving abundantly to Paul's need on several occasions. In fact, he tells them in this letter, you gave me more than I could possibly use. It's a problem I've been wrestling with. <laughs> Believe me, they were a congregation that would cause a rabbi or pastor's heart to leap for joy, to rejoice. Every time he thought about them, he rejoiced. Everything they did demonstrated their love and their generosity. And as he writes them, you might not know, but he was a prisoner. He was writing them as a prisoner, in prison, in Rome, in chains. And wanting to support him, Philippi sent one of their congregants named Epaphroditus with money and gifts. They instructed him to give the rabbi this money to meet his needs and to stay with him as long as he needs ministry, as long as he needs help. Well, when Epaphroditus arrived with their gifts, Rabbi Shaul, he's understandably overwhelmed by their love and their thoughtfulness. He writes this letter back to them saying, 
I have so much joy. Don't worry about me. Though I am a prisoner, yeah, that does not touch my joy at all. It doesn't touch my joy, not at all. Shaul is showing us something here, brothers and sisters. He's showing us that trials don't touch joy. Trials don't touch joy if it's the joy of the Spirit in a Spirit-filled life. And that's something that you need to get a hold of. Do you have and are you leading a Spirit-filled life? It's not about all the manifestations. It's not about the theological gymnastics, the healing, and the speaking in tongues, and all the strange manifestations, though they are part potentially, of a spirit-filled life. Nevertheless, a truly spirit-filled life is a life full of joy that trials and difficulties can't touch. That's what a spirit-filled life is all about. Trials, in fact, may become occasions of deeper joy. Because why? You've been there. Every one of you have been there. For one reason or another. What do the, what the trials do? They draw you in to a deeper, more intimate relationship with the Lord. William Kelly wrote this. Speaking of Rabbi Shaul, think of him in prison for years. Years. Chained between two soldiers. Debarred from the work he loved, and others taking advantage of his absence to grieve him. Preaching the very gospel out of contention and strife, and yet his heart was so running over with joy that he was filling others up with it. His joy in prison was so abundant that the prisoners around him were worshiping the Lord as well. Do any of you have that problem? Just being in your company, people start praising the Lord because they love hanging out with Tom. They start worshiping the Lord. Start hanging out with Linda. Is that a problem we have? It's a good one. It's a good problem. Rabbi Shaul's of expressions, his expressions of joy or rejoice or be glad appear 17 different times in this letter to Philippi alone. Now you may or may not have heard of Lucian. He was a Greek satirist of the 2nd century AD. And his ridicule of Greek mythology and of Christianity earned him the nickname the Blasphemer. What a legacy. Even so, God caused him to leave something edifying for us. He said of Christians of his day, and I quote, It is incredible to see the fervor with which the people of that religion help each other in their wants. They spare nothing. Their first legislator, Jesus, has put it in their heads that they are brethren. Now, he didn't get it. But he was making the observation. See, when Yeshua was here, Yochanan said this, everyone will know that you are my Talmudim or my disciples by the fact that you have love for each other. That's how they know. Not by our clothing. Not because we can sing Ain Kael Hanan. Not by our knowledge of the Torah not by our awareness of all the pain things in the world. Not by our shining morality. No. What distinguishes us from the rest of the world and proves the reality of God's life in us <laughs> is our heartfelt love for one another. Did you know, did you know the Bible prescribes 26 different ways to care for each other. It's true. 26 different ways to care for each other. God gives 26 different one another, that phrase, one another, 
26 one another commands. And you may ask, why so many? Well, first, first, because our relationships with each other are central to our covenant relationship with Yeshua. Did I say that? Let me say that again, because that really needs to get etched into your kishka, okay? Because our relationships with here, with each other, are central, central to our covenant relationship with Yeshua. Many Messianics, Christians alike, treat this principle I just declared to you as peripheral, as peripheral or even irrelevant, as a busy, unlocking all the paganists and everything. Especially in comparison to just biblical knowledge. But how we relate to one another is the essence of expressing the faith we profess. How else can we explain verses like 1 John 3.17? If someone has worldly possessions and sees their brother or sister in need, yet closes their heart against them, how could they be loving God? How could they be loving God? It is in relationship, brothers and sisters, that we work on our faith and find if it is real. If you are sitting in your house at the computer on Shabbat, there's no relationship. And if there's no relationship, then there's no presence of God. Remember, assembly is required. Assembly is required. Now, the second reason God speaks so often about how we care for one another is because relating to sinners, it's difficult. Now, before you go point your finger, those sinners, well, we all are. So relating to each other is difficult. Right? I've shared this many times. Right, Kyle? Messianics are... Messy. <laughs> messy. Y'all are messy. And I am too. Which demands debt to self and to selfish desires. We are challenged to declare the Torah is good and live it even when it's mitzvot cross our very desires. Our fleshly desires. That's a challenge. Be honest. Be honest. How do you genuinely feel about the company of the people that you're keeping? Are you thankful for them? Do you appreciate the relationships you have? Some you choose, some you don't. Amen? Right? You appreciate those relationships, huh? We're reminded in Kohelet, or Ecclesiastes, to relish life with the spouse you love each and every day of your precarious life. Because each day is God's gift. Sadly, many marriages are more a matter of endurance than enjoyment. Truthfully, truthfully, many of us don't really value the people in our lives. Truthfully. If you're a brute honest with yourself, you really don't. You step over them. There's speed bumps in your life. You sidestep them. You, like I said, you endure them. Yeah, we tolerate people. We put up with them. We endure them rather than there being a source of joy to us like they were for Shaul. What does it take? What will it take? For us, whether it's this congregation or we as a body in the side, what will it take for us to appreciate and be thankful for the people in our lives. I believe that in this opening letter to Philippi from Rabbi Shaul, that he has given us something to think about and how to do that. And I think there's four things here. First is to be thankful. To simply begin with an attitude of gratitude. To be thankful for the people that God has put in your life. And I'm going to unpack that a little bit. Not every memory in your life is a good memory. Is it? No, no. no. Not every experience in your life has been a good experience, has it? No. And I'm sure, well, you can be sure it's the same for me. 
But we need to be thankful that God has placed people in our lives to help us grow. God is big enough to take the good stuff and work it for our benefit, but he, he's also big enough to take the bad stuff and work it for our benefit as well. You all remember Romans 8, 28. You probably can recite it right before me, right now. You want to do it? We know that God causes everything to work together for of those who, who love God and are called Amen. You know it. You can read it. Thank you. Now you and I can dwell in the negative. Most people do. Linda and I were talking about this this morning. We're surrounded by people these days that are more about what they're against than what they're for. It's unbelievable to me. People just supposedly call Yeshua Lord or whatever they want to call him. Some people are calling him everything but Lord anymore. But we can dwell on that negative. You can get stuck on the painful memories. But I would rather dwell on what I have learned from a person. Some people have given me negative examples not to follow. Bible's full of people like that. While others have given me good examples to follow. In both scenarios, I need to be thankful for all the people in my life. Whether good or bad, I learn from each of them. And maybe you have in your past been hurt been hurt by a parent, been hurt by a partner or a friend, and you're still being hold on, still holding on to that hurt. You're still focusing on the bad, still focusing and dwelling on the negative. Learn to grow from the experience, and then let's just move on. Let's quit wallowing in something you can't change. Learn to forgive. Thank God that you can learn from the good and the bad. And also try to find good in people. It's there. We're creating the God's image. Some of it might be a little harder to find, but it's there. You know, I've heard wives say this. And it goes both ways. I'm going to use wives. Well, he's a good man, but... Boy, is he or isn't he? He's a good man, but... Anytime you hear but used in this way... It means the emphasis is on the negative. It's not on the positive. Be grateful for what you've got. Mr. Perfect, I can promise you, and I've got my hand high on that one, does not exist. I know I get confused sometimes, and I, I wrestle with that. It's a struggle I have. Be grateful for the good in other people. In verse 5 of our text, Shaul was thankful for the Philippians' loyalty. Paul says he is thankful for, he says, your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Take a moment, think about it. Who's been loyal in your life? Probably just a couple people, right? You know who they are. The ones that are running in when everybody's running out. Who's been really loyal to you? Maybe it was somebody at work, I don't know. Maybe it was a friend, a husband, a wife, family member. Maybe they didn't do anything really spectacular, but time and time again, when they had every opportunity to throw you under the bus, they didn't, like everybody else was. They stuck with you. They hung in there. You remember when you're going through your bankruptcy and all the Christians are pointing the finger at you? When you're going through your divorce, you lost your job, remember that? You got caught in an embarrassing sin. No matter what it is, they were there. They never left. They were loyal. If you want to appreciate others, you've got to focus on their strengths and not their weaknesses. With some people, it takes a lot, like I said, a lot of creativity. But you can find something good. If you're committed to it, you'll find the good in people. Which takes me to my second point. Pray, pray for people. Paul tells us to pray for people. To pray for them. Be thankful for them and to pray for them. He says, whenever I pray for all of you, I always pray with joy. 
that what you do for people? Do you pray for joy? Or do you pray the Lord rebuke you? <laughs> Isn't it encouraging when you know people are praying for you? When they are remembering you? Amen. Folks, if you want a relationship to change from good or from bad to good, you want to turn it around, I got some really good advice. Start praying for this other person. And this will do two things. The first thing is, it'll change your attitude towards them. And secondly, it may very well change their attitude towards you. Towards you. And positive praying is a lot more powerful than what the world thinks is positive thinking. Okay? Thinking it won't do anything. But positive prayer will. People may negate your, your advice, right? I mean, you know you can help somebody. You know you can say something that will transform and change their life. You can see it. They're so into it. They can't see their nose. Remember they say the hardest thing you, see in your, you can see is your nose. It's the closest thing to you. You can't see it. Isn't that crazy? Funniest thing. But, but sometimes you can see something in somebody's life and you can give them advice. Lord, just listen to me. But they negate it. Or they might reject your appeals. Path or run is not a good path. I'm appealing to you. Don't do it. Now they ignore you. They might even ignore your suggestions. They may resist your help, but they are powerless against your prayers. Amen. Nothing they can do about that. <laughs> Maybe consider praying for others like Rabbi Shaul expressed in verses 9 through 11, Philippians 1. And this is my prayer. That your love may more and more overflow in fullness of knowledge and depth of discernment so that you will be able to determine what is best and thus be pure and without blame for the day of Messiah, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Yeshua the Messiah to the glory and praise of God. So praying these four things, there are four things in there. Shaul emphasizes it's you can know that your prayer will be answered. Why? Because it's what God wants. There's nothing more powerful in a prayer than if you pray God's will and desires. That's what he wants us to pray for. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thy will be done. Your will be done. So in that prayer, from verse 9 to 11... Rabbi Shaul is telling us that we first should pray that they will grow in love with wisdom. Paul says he prays that their love may more and more overflow in fullness of knowledge and depth of discernment. All of us could use more love for one another and also know how to show it in wisdom. Paul prays that love may abound, may increase with knowledge and discernment. Then he says, pray that we may have spiritual, or they may have spiritual discernment. Pray that they have wisdom, pray that they have discernment. Sounds like the, the greater gifts spoken of in the Tanakh, right? Wisdom, understanding, knowledge, the greater gifts. Well, people are busy in other congregations, flopping on the floor, barking, screaming, yelling, speaking in tongues, whatever. Why don't we go for the greater gifts, Paul says. Let's go for wisdom, knowledge, understanding. He says that you will be able to determine what is best and thus be pure. We can all benefit from spiritual discernment. We all need to help figure out what is good and what is bad, what is true and what is false, what is pagan, what is holy. We need to find those things that are the best. We need to find those things that are superior and hold them up as our standards of living. Everyone needs spiritual discernment in their lives. Pray for that in the people that you know. So wisdom, discernment, and then pray that they grow in holiness and righteous living. Without blame, Paul says, for the day of the Messiah, in verse 10. And holiness includes being what? Well, this is the rare virtue today. It's called honesty. Pray that they're honest. 
Pray that they're sincere. Pray that they're non-offensive. Pray that they're pure. Every believer should want these qualities in their lives, and we should pray for each other that these qualities be displayed in daily living. And finally, pray that they will be spiritually productive. And he says that in verse 11. Being filled with the fruit of righteousness. Don't you want a productive life? You know, I, I, it was cold putting that sign up. I'll admit, it wasn't exactly fun. But it feels good to be productive feels good to believe that the time that I had produced something, something positive. I was productive. I do this because I believe, not only because I'm called, but I believe that it's going to make an impact on somebody. If I get one or two, you know, transformed out of this deal, then I feel I accomplished something. It makes me feel productive. I feel it. Like makes me feel like I've had an impact in a positive way in this world. That's what we need to pray for others. Pray for people that they will be spiritually productive. Shaul says if you want to join people in your life, you first must be grateful for the good and then practice positive praying. Not only should you be thankful for the people in your life and pray for them, but you should also, and that's the third point today, be patient. Be patient. Be thankful for the people in your life. Pray for the people in your life. And be patient with them. Be patient with them. Most things in life take time. Most good things take time. I courted my wife for a year. No, I, I take that back. I knew her for a year. Good things take time. It takes time to get to know somebody. It takes time to get something done. I wish that I could walk in here and everything that needs to be done in this congregation would be done like that. It's not happening that way. But as the Lord provides gifted people, and you know who they are, because if I say their names, they'll get mad at me. But as the Lord blesses us with talented, gifted people, we're able to accomplish things. And that's not negating those who worked so hard in the past before they came in. And slowly but surely, things begin to happen. Things begin to evolve. It takes time. Positive relationships with people are no exception. But you will look at people's future and not so much at their past. Maybe that's what we need to do, too. Because we all got a past. Now, where do you want to be, you know, where do you want to be scrutinized? In your past? Or do you want to be scrutinized in your potential future? Amen? Amen. <clears throat> That's what Paul did. He looked at their potential. And he was very patient with their progress. Look at what he says in verse 6 of Philippians. Follow along with me. Well, I'll, just, I'll go ahead and read myself. You probably all have memorized. And I am sure of this. That the one who began a good work among you will keep it growing until it is completed... On the day of Messiah Yeshua. Shaul says, when God starts, brother, he finishes it, doesn't he? When God started your life with salvation, he will bring it to an eventual completion. God does not leave things like so many of us do, half done. He brings it to completion. Humankind is a great starter, but we stink at finishing. How often in our history as a humankind we have unfinished symphonies or unfinished buildings or unfinished books or unfinished projects? Humankind doesn't always finish what they start, but God always finishes what he starts. He does not make an unfinished flower. He doesn't make an unfinished star. He puts the finishing touches on everything he does, and then he says, it is tohu. Is good. God began a good work in you, brothers and sisters. He is in the process of doing something in you. You're not the same today as you were yesterday. You're not the same 
today as you were a month ago. You're not the same as you were six months ago or a year ago. You're not the same as you were five years ago. God has begun a good work in you. Right, Kyle? God has done a good work in you. And Kyle will tell you when we met. But others will tell you, Kyle can read Torah. He's not done. Still got a lot of work to do on me, and you, and everybody here. Taking us all a long way, hasn't he? We're a work in progress. He's in the process of changing each one of us into the image of his son, Messiah Yeshua, the perfect. God in the flesh. God in the flesh. He is not going to give up on you, and he hasn't given up on them. He will complete what he has started, in spite of hang-ups, faults, decisions, bad ones. Whatever your sins are, God is still working in your life. Amen? In spite of all the circumstances that I face in life, God is going to finish in me and in you what he has started. And we're going to make it. We're going to get there, aren't we? But we need to be patient with the progress. Patient with each other. If God is not finished with you, how can you expect him to be finished with the people around you? So you, you need to be, again, very patient with the work that he's doing with those around you. Enjoy people. Enjoy as they grow, change, and develop. You know, we should all be able to say, I am not the person I used to be. You want to say that? I am not the person I used to be. I think that's a fair statement for all of us, isn't it? Sure it is. Let's say this then. I am not the person I want to be. Is that true? But we all are the person that is allowing God to change. We are all the people that God is we've allowed God to change. And change takes time. I'm growing, I'm changing. Some wrong way. But allow God to change your life, too. Be patient with me as I am patient with you, as we should be patient with each other. Because, as I've said many times, I still have mastered the skill of walking on water. If any of you have got that down, please let me know right away. Yeah. It's enough. I got it. Thank you. You Come have to wait till it's frozen. Yeah. <laughs> Always the wise guy. We are not finished yet, and that doesn't happen in the side of heaven. On this side of heaven, we're still being changed, we're still in the process, we're still growing. Let's make room for growth. So finally, my fourth point. We are to be thankful for people, we're to pray for people, we're to be patient with people, and finally, we are simply just to love the people in our lives. To love them. And I've discovered that if people are not in my heart, and they're going to get on my nerves. Right? Aren't you amazed how patient you can really be with your children? Because when somebody else is like your children, you choke them. Right? Keith or Peter tells us this, more than anything, keep loving each other actively because love covers many, many sins. You can put up with an awful lot of stuff if you love the person. And love begins with understanding. Maybe you, maybe you don't know the background of the person you're sitting next to here this morning. Maybe you do. But you might not know a lot about them. You might not know about their problems. You might not know about their struggles. You might not know what their baggage is or history is. Maybe you should find out. It's not getting into their business. But at least showing an interest. They'll tell you what they want, they want you to know and what they don't want you to know. Maybe... He or she are tons better than they used to be 10 years ago. And they're in the process of working some things out. Hear their hurt. Listen to their problems. Find out what makes them tick. Care. 
can't love someone you don't understand. You need to understand the moods of the people you are around. You need to understand what they're feeling. If you know they're having a bad day, perhaps it's not a good time to confront them. Perhaps it's better just to leave them be. They say one of the best things for a grieving person is not to spew a bunch of scripture out and talk, talk, talk. A lot of times when somebody's grieving and lost, just be there. That's all they want. They don't want to hear what you have to say. They want to hear your pompous, you know, preaching. They just, they just want you to be there for them. Just be there. That's all they want. There's times open your mouth, there's times to keep it shut. And that's the time to keep it shut. But understand what those times are. Love chooses the right time. And love chooses the right words. Listen to what Shul has to say about love. Most of you may know this passage. I may speak in tongues of men and even angels, but if I lack love, I become merely blaring brass or a clanging symbol. I'm not ready to crash on those symbols. I may have the gift of prophecy. I may fathom all the mysteries and know all things, have all faith, enough to move mountains. But if I lack love, I have nothing. I may give away everything that I own. I may even hand over my body to be burned. But if I lack love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. It's not jealous. It's not boastful. It's not proud. It's certainly not rude. It's selfish. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. For those of you who are passive aggressives and store it all up for like a year and then one argument blurt it all out there, I know how you are. Yeah. Just remind yourself of this passage. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Just like God says, your sins are as far as the east is from the west. God chooses to forget. Love does not gloat over other people's sins. It takes to light the truth. Love always bears up. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always endures. Love never ends, but prophecies will pass, and tongues will cease, and knowledge will pass. For our knowledge is partial. Boy, we need to hear that. Our knowledge is partial, and our prophecy partial. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, thought like a child, argued like a child. Now that I've become a man, I have finished with my childish ways. For now we see obscurely in a mirror. But then it will be face to face, panim el panim. Now I know partly, then I will know fully, just as God has fully known me. But for now, three things last. What are they? Trust, hope, Love and the greatest of these is love. the greatest of these is love. the greatest of these is love. folks. Here is a fact: it's easier to talk about love than it is to live it. But that doesn't take away the fact that we are to practice love. Listen to what John says in First John: the way that we have come to know love is through His having laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Yeshua loved us so much, what did he do? He gave us no, there's no greater gift that he could have given, and he gave it. He gave his life. The perfect gave his life up to the imperfect. Shouldn't that make us at least be motivated to love other people? If he would do that much for us, can't we at least try? Can't we at least attempt to show people the same grace that he's given us? Life is too short. Life is too short to not enjoy the people in your life. So perhaps, as I conclude, perhaps like Leah, maybe it's time. Would you agree with me? Maybe it's time that we have a cosmic shift in our attitude towards each other. 
like land. If you don't learn to enjoy the people that God has placed around you in your life, I promise you're probably on the borderline of miserable. As Shaul begins his great book about joy, he starts off by talking about how we can enjoy people as well. People will rob your joy unless you learn how to respond to them the way that Yeshua did. Let's become, let's, now we become, let's commit this season of Thanksgiving like Leah did, or like Rabbi Shaul did. Let's be modeani. Let's be thankful for each other. Father, we, we even dance this dance. It's so easy for us to give thanks to you. But are we thankful for each other? Are we thankful for these problematic people you put in our life? I'm certainly glad that the people that love me love the problematic me. I'm thankful, Father, that because I have relationship and because I value relationship, that I know that I have the presence of your Holy Spirit in my life. And I think, Father, that's something we all want. We want the joy that passes all understanding. And that joy and that peace can only come from the reality of your Spirit in our lives, which is evidenced in our active relationships, our value of relationships, our thankfulness for relationships. You have put people in our life, Father. Now, Father, help us to embrace them, to enjoy them, to love them, but to be patient with them, to pray for them, to be thankful for them. We pray these things in Yeshua's name and the congregation says. Congregation says, Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.